Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text for this evening is Matthew 27, beginning at verse 35, going through verse 44, which reads, And when they had crucified him, they divided his garments among them by casting lots. Then they sat down and kept watch over him there, and over his head they put the charge against him, which read, This is Jesus, King of the Jews. Then two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and one on the left. And those who passed by deride him, wagging their heads and saying, Who he, You who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. So also the chief priests with the scribes and elders mocked him, saying, He saved others, he cannot save himself. He is the King of Israel, let him come down now from the cross, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God, let God deliver him now if he desires him. For he said, I am the Son of God. And the robbers who were crucified with him also reviled him in the same way. Here ends the text. He looked nothing like a king. I'm sure you've all seen the same pictures I have of what a king is supposed to look like. A king is always very regal looking, sitting on a throne. They almost always are wearing the very finest clothing and are almost always wearing some type of crown that is encrusted with jewels. Kings are usually pictured with their adoring subjects all around them so they can be seen as rulers who are kind to the people they have authority over. When you picture a king, you usually will see them in the finest food and a lot of it. They ride in fine carriages being pulled by magnificent horses adorned in fine leather. No matter whom it is they rule, kings always look the part. Not Jesus. Although he is our king, he looked nothing like one. He had been stripped of everything he, that he was wearing. He was beaten and bloodied at the hands of the Roman soldiers. Instead of a crown of fine jewels, the soldiers forced onto his head a crown of thorns. This crown was pushed on with so much force that his head was now bleeding into his eyes. He was mocked, ridiculed, and scorned. He was forced to wear a purple robe, but not as a way to show his authority, but only as a way to further mock him. Instead of riding in a fine carriage, he was forced to, to walk to Golgotha, carrying the very cross on which he would be crucified. He hadn't slept. There was no banquet waiting him at the end of the long journey. The only thing waiting for him was a horrible and gruesome death. He looked nothing like a king. Jesus is not pictured with all of his adoring subjects around him. At the foot of the cross are the scribes and Pharisees, all yelling at him, He saved others. He cannot save himself. He is the King of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let, him, let God deliver him now, if he, de if he desires him. For he said, I am the Son of God. He is always shown with two robbers who are being crucified with him, one on his right, one on his left. And although they were also condemned to death, they're mocking Christ right along with everyone else. The only thing that set Jesus apart from these two criminals, and the only way that anyone would know he was a king, was the sign above his head that said, This is the king of the Jews. It was put there as a final cruel joke to mock Jesus one more time. They mocked God's king. The passerby shake their heads at him and revile him. The envious chief priests, scribes, and elders don't like his popularity one bit and rail at him to prove his kingship. Even two robbers who are facing the same punishment direct their insults at Jesus' head. If you passed by the scene, would you think that the person hanging on that cross was a king? You might think, Wow, robbers being executed, that's kind of a harsh punishment. In a way, you're right. We're fortunate that today, if you're convicted of stealing anything, you wouldn't immediately be put to death. Yet in Roman society, that's exactly what happened. The ancient world didn't have the infrastructure needed to care for criminals on a long-term basis. 
Usually you were only in prison long enough to be tried and then you were either let go or you were executed. The Romans didn't take kindly to those people who broke their laws and the punishments were harsh. It's kind of lucky that we live in a more modern society. Are we lucky though? The truth is that we would still be condemned to death for the transgressions we've committed. You might think, I'm not a thief. I've never stolen anything. I think that we can all agree that we've borrowed something in our lifetime. It may have been a box of staples from work or a pen that you didn't think anyone would notice. A candy bar from the local convenience store. It doesn't matter how big or how small the item is, stealing is stealing. And all stealing will earn you death in the eyes of our Heavenly Father. Because of your sin, you deserve to be executed, just like the two thieves were. It doesn't just stop at stealing. Our sin goes much deeper than that. If we want to be honest, we are more like the scribes and the Pharisees than we care to admit. Before you say, oh, I haven't done anything like that, stop and think about it for a minute. Haven't you too stood in judgment of the Lord just as the scribes and Pharisees did? Often judging him to be unfair to you because of some hardship that you faced in your life. Consider how often you have turned from the Lord's word and demanded that he prove his love. What were you thinking when your bitterness drove you to insist that you deserve better, even though you are as guilty before God as any other criminal? Consider tonight your many resentful and angry thoughts toward Jesus and consider the judgment that should come down on your head. If not for the king on the cross, the sentence we would have to face would be death. No appeal, no way out of it. We would be forever lost to our sin if not for the bloodied and ugly king who hung on the cross. Consider the thoughts going on in his sacred head and be exceedingly glad. For his thoughts are not about getting revenge or pushing back the scorn onto the heads of sinners. His thoughts toward you are not filled with disgust. What's going on in the head of that king are thoughts of love toward you and doing what is necessary to bear your scorn and save you. The sign above his head did read, This is Jesus, King of the Jews, and that's good because we would have never identified him as God's king. Nobody would have ever said, now there's the head of a king. He set aside his kingly might voluntarily to die in weakness and disgrace. He was rich, yet for sinner's sake he became poor, so that you might become rich. Placed on the throne of the cross, he was unrecognizable as a king, but just perfect to do the job of taking your sins away so that the Father might recognize you forever as the king's friend and heir. Notice that the king remains silent as he bears the persecution, the insults, and the rage. That head lifted up high on a cross now hangs down and is bloody, but it's a beautiful head to sinners who know that he bears the wrath man's, as man's substitute. Take great comfort in all that is happening in this scene. For our crucified king is all about crowning you with glory and honor. So that means he must wear your anger at him like a crown of thorns. Jesus, your king, was all about lifting that burden of guilt from your shoulders. So he shrouded it all to the cross and destroyed it. So that you might be exalted as innocent and holy sons of God. Those ears on his head heard all the insults in all the bitterness, so that your ears would clearly hear the words of absolution. Your king was persecuted, reviled, rejected, and killed, but raised again to anoint you in baptism with the forgiveness won for you on the cross. From that king on the cross comes life-giving water that fills the baptismal font and washes away your sin. And from that dead king on the cross comes the life-giving blood that fills the chalice that you drink, cleansing you from all sin and lifting up your head in triumph. In Jesus' name, amen.
Now the peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.